it's really my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, uh, Sergei Eliseev. Um, Sergei completed his uh, bachelor's and master's studies at the University of St. Petersburg uh, before moving to the Physical Institute in, in Gießen for his PhD work, um, which uh, involved studying exotic nuclei using an ortho time of flight mass spectrometer. After his PhD, he worked for a number of years at ShipTrap in Darmstadt uh, before finally becoming a group leader at the Pentatrap project in 2008. Um, we're really excited to hear your talk today on mass spectrometry. And uh, we, and with that, I'd like to open the floor up to you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jack, very much for your kind introduction and for giving me this opportunity to present the Pentatrap experiment in this series of virtual seminars. Um, and good afternoon to everybody who is listening to my talk. The structure of my talk is pretty simple, so it's divided into two more or less equally long parts. So since the audience, I hope at least, is diverse and probably not all of you are familiar with high precision pen and trap mass spectrometry, I've decided not to directly dive into, into details of, of the pentatrap experiment, but instead I will introduce to you first very basic ideas that underline high precision pen and trap mass spectrometry. So half an hour on, on basics and half an hour on, on the pentatrap experiment. So let's, let's get started. Wait, I cannot switch for some reasons. Hmm. Ah, okay, let's get started. Uh, the object of our research are nucleids. So they are arranged into a three dimensional uh, chart of nucleids or nuclear chart, the, uh, wait, maybe I'll minimize, okay. The X uh, and the Y axis represent the number of neutrons and the number of protons in the nucleus respectively. The third uh, dimension represents or can represent in principle any property of nucleus you're interested in at the moment. And I've chosen, for example, to, to show here the half-lives of, of nucleus. Um, the third uh, uh, dimension is for convenience, depicted in the form of, of a color code. And all nucleots are confined between the proton and the neutron drip lines. So this is, this is the region of the existence of, of nuclear matter. So there are approximately 250 stable nucleots, uh, which form the value of beta stability. And so they comprise about 10% of known nucleots and uh, one, one uh, predicts the existence of about 7,000 nucleots or so. So the majority of nucleots are in fact radioactive and moreover they are short-lived with a half-life shorter than, uh, than several minutes. Uh, one of the, uh, the key parameters of a nucleot is its mass. So it's just the sum of the masses of all protons and all neutrons in the nucleus, plus uh, the sum of the masses of all atomic electrons, uh, minus the binding energies of, of the nucleus and the atomic electrons respectively. So by measuring the mass of a nucleus, or, or to be more precise, the mass ratio or mass differences of nucleus in a certain region of nuclear chart, one can get insight into, into the structure of, uh, of these nucleids, into how they, they decay, how long they live, how they can be produced, uh, produced in nature. And uh, the masses of these nucleids are usually poorly known or not known at all, maybe with exception of uh, stable uh, nucleids predominantly in, in light mass region. And um, how precisely we have to determine the mass ratios of nucleus depends upon particular physics. For example, for, uh, uh, for the investigation of nuclear structure, for the test, uh, test of nuclear models, mass formulas, for the investigation of uh, nuclear uh, synthesis or nuclear production in nature, um, it's sufficient to determine mass ratios with uh, uh, moderate uncertainties of 10 to minus 6 to 10 to minus uh, 7. Uh, for some studies of, of weak interaction, uncertainties down to 10 to minus uh, 8 might be required. These measurements face two major issues that render these measurements uh, very challenging, uh, actually difficult. 
uh, these are the half lives of nucleids and and their production rates. So. Uh, the half-lives can be as short as um, milliseconds or below. Production rates can be as small as uh, an event in several days or weeks even. Um, in uh, offline mass, mass, mesh, uh, mass ratio measurements on stable nucleates, of course, there are no, uh, no such constraints, constraints imposed by uh, half-lives and production rates of nucleates. The major issue here are extremely low uncertainties, uh, uh, down to 10 to minus 11 or even below um, uh, in uh, mass ratio measurements on stable nucleates. Such uncertainties are required by uh, many experiments, for example, by experiments on the determination of, of the neutrino mass, uh, on the search for the fifth, uh, fourth for the test of QD in strong electromagnetic fields for, for search for atomic metastable states. And um, uh, currently uh, the only mass measurement technique which is capable of, ach of achieving such uncertainties in uh, mass measurements on short-lived nucleates as well as on stable nucleates uh, is high precision penny trap mass uh, spectrometry. Uh, the, uh, basic idea uh, that underlies uh, the pen trap mass spectrometry is a trapping of over nine with charge Q and mass M in a, in a strong homogeneous magnetic field. In such a field, uh, the ion is forced to perform um, a circular motion in the plane, so in the radial plane, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. Um, we call this motion the cyclotron motion or the free cyclotron motion. And the frequency of the free cyclotron motion is inversely proportional to the uh, ion's mass, proportional to, to the uh, ion's charge and to the strength of the magnetic field. So by measuring the ratio of, of the uh, cyclotron frequencies of two ions, one can directly determine the ratio of their masses. And here for simplicity, I just assume that the ions are in the same charge state. And uh, almost always one is interested in actually the mass ratio, so mass differences, not in absolute masses. On, uh, on the right hand side, I list the major factors that in fact make uh, the penguin trap the most accurate mass spectrometer currently. So uh, first, uh, the mass of a nucleate is determined by measuring its free cycle of frequency. And we know that the frequency, is the uh, physical quantity, which can be measured very precisely. Second, um, uh, the amplitude of the ion motion uh, in the trap, so the confinement volume of the ion motion can be very small. Um, uh, the confinement volume depends on, on the strength of the magnetic field and on the ion's kinetic energy. And by making use of uh, very strong magnetic fields of, of several Tesla and by applying various ion, ion motion uh, cooling techniques, one, one can reduce uh, uh, the amplitudes of the ion motions in the, in the trap to, to a few microns or even below. And one can create uh, very strong, very homogeneous, very stable magnetic fields. All these uh, facilitates uh, uh, very precise mass ratio measurements. Uh, here are just a couple of examples of, of the magnets used in high precision penny trap mass spectrometry. In the online pinion trap experiments, uh, shape trap, GFL trap, trigger trap, one uses seven Tesla superconducting uh, uh, solenoids or so magnets with horizontal warm bore. Such magnets have uh, two regions of homogeneous magnetic field, so you can place uh, two traps in, in one magnet. And uh, relative magnetic field drift stability is usually better than five times 10 to minus nine per hour, which is uh, totally sufficient for online measurements. In offline pen and trap experiments like uh, Pentatrap, Helium-3 trap at our institute, one often goes for uh, superconducting magnets with vertical cold bore. So magnetic field strengths are the same. And with some additional measures, one can stabilize the uh, magnetic field drift uh, on a level down to 10 to minus uh, 11 per hour. So it's a extremely uh, stable magnetic field, uh, which can be created actually in the lab. Unfortunately, um, just a, a pure homogeneous magnetic field doesn't make the pinion trap yet because uh, 
ions can freely move along the magnetic field lines and in this way just escape the trapping volume in order to provide three-dimensional confinement, ion motion confinement, we superimpose onto magnetic field lines a weak harmonic electrostatic potential and such a combination of two fields uh, creates a well-known pinion trap. And due to the presence of this additional uh, uh, electrostatic field, the ion motion in the pinion trap uh, becomes a little bit more complex than just the pure free structure motion. So it it's can be divided or it can be treated uh, as uh, three independent trap motions. So two radial motions and one axial motion. The axial motion is just <clears throat> the oscillation of the ion and the electrostatic potential. And one of the radial motion is a cyclotron motion, but with a re uh, reduced frequency, so a new plus. And the other radial motion is a slow magnetron motion, uh, which is caused by the cross product of, of two fields, so magnetic field and uh, electrostatic field. Unfortunately, uh, none of the trap frequencies is the free cyclotron frequency uh, one would like to determine. Um, so, um, in general, we have to measure all three trap frequencies in order to determine the free cyclotron frequency uh, by using the so called invariance theorem. Uh, but um, if it's sufficient to measure the cyclotron frequency with a moderate uncertainty, and uh, usually this is the case uh, in uh, an online pin and trap experiments um, on short lived nucleates, then a somewhat uh, simpler relation holds between the free cell frequency and the trap frequencies. And we use just this relation to determine masses of short lived nucleates. On, uh, on the left hand side, I list typical values of trap, trap frequencies in, in the offline experiment pattern trap and in the online experiment ship trap. Uh, you can see just clearly see the hierarchy of frequencies uh, in, in pinion traps. Um, in the Panda trap experiment, uh, we have to uh, work with highly charged ions in order to be able to, to reach uh, required uncertainty, very low uncertainty in a mass or frequency ratio determination. Uh, in uh, online experiments like ship trap, one prefers to, to work with low charge ions, so singly charged and doubly charged. Um, ions. So, to my knowledge, uh, there are 10 functioning high precision pinion trap facilities or setups uh, scattered across North America and, and Europe. Uh, seven of them comprise the group of online pinion trap facilities, which are located at, at large RIP facilities or radioactive ion beam facilities. Uh, the other three they form the group of offline pinion trap setups for experiments on, on stable uh, nucleates. And the online facilities, they're in fact complementary to each other. So they do measurements on, on short lived nucleus produced in different uh, uh, nuclear reactions. So they probe different regions of, of the nuclear chart. And uh, uh, the mass spectrometers or um, uh, the setups within the same group, they're, they're very similar in construction and operation. So I've just uh, picked uh, 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 two mass uh, uh, spectrometers uh, as example for each group. For, um, uh, for the offline uh, uh, group, I've chosen the pentatype experiment due to, due to obvious uh, uh, reasons, since uh, pentatype is actually the topic of my talk today. And as a representative of, of the online uh, facilities, uh, I've been just a ship trap experiment because I spent four years of my postdoc at ship trap and know these online pin and trap uh, setup better than the other uh, setups. So I will uh, first start with ship trap, then I will just directly move on to, to the panther trap experiment and spend just uh, the second half of my talk on, on the panther trap experiment. So ship trap. Um, here I would like to emphasize, emphasize that actually I'm not going to uh, to give any details specific to ship trap, and I'm not going to talk about the measurement program at ship trap. For for these details, I refer to Michael Bloch, the leader of the ship trap experiment, who gave just recently um, in the framework of, of the, uh, these virtual seminars and uh, overview talk uh, of the uh, ship trap experiment. 
I my turn will uh, will outline just uh, only those features of ship trap uh, uh, that are just common to to almost all online pinning trap facilities. So such an online pinning trap facility has uh, usually a section which serves to stop high energy uh, production, uh, uh, reaction production, or reaction products. So a chip trap, this is usually, uh, this is a cryogenic stopping chamber filled with helium gas uh, at the pressure of uh, a few 10, a few 10 millibars. So the uh, reaction products just stop in the stopping chamber. And then they're uh, extracted from the stopping chamber uh, as a continuous beam of low charge ions, so single charge ions or so doubly charged ions. And so uh, this uh, continuous beam of ions is guided further into, into a helium gas field uh, radio frequency, a linear radio frequency quadrupole, which we call just for short, uh, Kula Bancha. In the Kula Bancha, the continuous beam is, uh, is converted into, uh, into ion bunches, which on demand are just sent into the pen and trap mass spectrometer. Um, uh, such an online pin and trap mass spectrometer has usually two traps. So a preparation trap and a measurement trap, a chip trap. These two traps see, sit in the same magnets and the magnet has uh, two regions of the homogeneous field. But uh, there are different configurations like, for example, Azel trap, where the traps sit in, in separate magnets. So the preparation trap is just a separator with high resolving power, a mass separator uh, that just lets only the ions of interest in, into the measurement trap. And in the measurement trap, uh, the cyclotron frequency of the ions of interest is measured either with uh, uh, to, uh, TOF ICR or with uh, the POICR uh, frequency measurement uh, techniques. So until recently, uh, only the Time of flight ion subton resonance uh, technique, or for short, TOF ICI technique, uh, was used for measuring uh, subton frequencies of, of short lived nucleates. It's based uh, on the measurement of the time of flight over nine between the pinion trap and an ion counter, so usually a micro channel play detector, which sits on the axis of the trap in a weak magnetic field. So the ion on its way. Uh, toward the detector passes through a strong gradient of, of the magnetic field where it gets accelerated by the force which is uh, proportional to the ion's orbital magnetic moment in the trap. Uh, so by uh, applying to the, um, uh, to the ion motion, uh, cyclotron motion, uh, a certain radio frequency uh, field of, of certain multipolarity with certain amplitude, frequency for certain time duration, one can uh, alter the ion's orbital magnetic moment in a controlled way. So it means one can alter the time of flight or ion. So one measures just the time of flight as a function of the frequency of the uh, radio frequency uh, field and obtains such a nice time of flight resonance curve. Uh, the minimum of, of this resonance happens to, to correspond to the free cyclotron frequency of, of the ion we want to determine. So in this way, we determine the free cyclotron uh, uh, frequency <clears throat> of the ions and hence its mass. Uh, some years ago, the seven years ago, uh, we developed a ship trap, uh, the phase uh, imaging ion cyclotron resonance technique, so for short, uh, PI-ICR. Uh, this technique, compared to the TOF ICR technique, offers uh, approximately five-fold uh, gain in precision and 50-fold gain in, in resolving power, which is a substantial step forward, I would say. Um, uh, the basic idea behind this uh, method is, is straightforward. Um, the ion in the pinion trap uh, performs in the radial motion, uh, in the radial plane, so in the plane perpendicular to the axis of the trap, two circular motions. Uh, the cyclotron motion uh, with the uh, frequency nu plus and the magnetron motion with uh, frequency nu minus. Why not just count uh, the number of revolutions uh, certain radial motion performs in a well-defined time t? So in fact, uh, one measures just the total phase of the radial motion, one of the radial motions in time t. 
And knowing the total phase and the time t, we can just calculate the frequency of, of this radial motion. And uh, we uh, measure the total phase uh, of the radial motion by just uh, projecting the iron position in the pendant trap at different times uh, onto the position sensitive detector and accumulate a so called uh, phase diagram. So, uh, record so uh, phase. Uh, a phase diagram and shown here is just a phase diagram of the magneton motion, for example. Okay, um, both techniques are very fast, in fact, and uh, what is more important, they're really sensitive to a single, singly charged iron or radiate room temperature. It means uh, it simplifies a lot, uh, mass spectrometer, you don't need to, to, to build a cryogenic pinion trap. But each metal has a reverse side. Uh, these techniques are destructive. It means, in order to obtain such a nice uh, time of flight resonance or, or phase diagram, we have to extract ions from the pinion trap. So ions just uh, get lost on, on the detector. So in, it means, in order to determine the free stack or frequency of an ion in the trap, uh, we have to have at least a few 10 ions. And uh, this is a major constraint uh, to, to such experiments, to experiments on um, determination of the masses of uh, nucleids uh, with very, very low production rates. And uh, I would like to end the introductory part with demonstrating some achievements uh, of ship trap, which, which have become uh, feasible actually due to the development of the PI uh, ICR detection technique. Um, recently, ship trap uh, carried out a series of uh, mass measurements on, on transuranium isotopes of nobelium, laurentium, and rusifolium using the PICI detection technique, and uh, they managed to resolve in laurentium 252 a uh, low line nuclear isomeric state uh, with just an excitation energy of 30 kV. Uh, thus having demonstrated the mass resolving power of 10 to 7, so 10, 10 million. So in my opinion, this is a breakthrough in mass measurements on uh, low-line nuclear isomeric states, uh, which are produced with very low production rates. So uh, uh, we saw just uh, on the detector about 14 events an hour, which is uh, really a low count rate for, for pinion traps. Okay, my congratulations to the ship trap team. Perfect. Okay, that was the introduction. Now I'm coming to the main part of my talk to the Pentatrap experiment. Uh, Pentatrap is situated at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Hadeberg in the division of stored and cooled ions. And the major goal of the Pentatrap experiment are measurements or mass ratio measurements on uh, Lone leaf and stable nucleids up to uranium with an uncertainty below 10 to minus 11, so 10 to minus 11 and uh, below. Uh, the experiment is located on, on two levels. On the upper level in the experimental hall, we have uh, two uh, ion sources for production of highly charged ions and some ion optics elements to guide ions from the ion sources uh, toward the uh, pinion trap mass spectrometer. So, and the pinion trap mass spectrometer is is located in the basement uh, under the experimental hall in a, in a room with a controlled environment. Currently, uh, we have access to uh, two EBIT ion sources, so Dresden EBIT ion source and cheap EBIT ion source. Um, in principle, uh, we can couple our experiment also to, to the large cryogenic EBIT if we decide at some point to, to do measurements on very heavy, very highly charged ions like uh, hydrogen like or bare lead or uranium. Such me measurements are needed, for example, if you want to test QED and strong electromagnetic fields. But currently, uh, we, uh, we work with these two EBITs. The Dresden EBIT um, uh, is a commercial uh, compact room temperature permanent magnet EBIT with a magnetic field strength of 200 millitesla, a maximum electron current of 30 uh, milliampere and maximum electron energy of 12 kV. Uh, this is a very compact uh, EBIT, uh, but despite its, uh, let's say, uh, smallness, 
we can produce these qubits uh, like rhenium ions or osmium ions for heavier ions up to a charge state of uh, 52 plus. So it's still a very powerful machine. Fortunately, uh, currently uh, we can produce highly charged ions only from uh, gases and volatile chemical compounds using this qubit and using the, the MIWOC inlet uh, uh, system. So the major uh, goal of, of the Dresden EBIT uh, is production of test ions for the optimization of, of the pinion trap mass spectrometer. Uh, but in principle, we can do also uh, real measurements with this uh, Dresden EBIT. Our first measurements on the stable isotopes of xenon and also on osmium and rhenium-187 were performed uh, with ions produced with the Dresden, Dresden EBIT. Uh, the other ion source, the TEEP EBIT, is a substantially larger machine, more powerful. Uh, it's based on the mini EBITs uh, developed at our institute in the group of uh, Jose Crespa. Um, it's also a room temperature permanent magnet uh, uh, EBIT, but a substantially stronger magnetic field and uh, maximum electron current. So we plan to uh, use this EBIT for production of highly charged ions of rare species from solid samples, uh, which uh, contain just down to 10 to 12 atoms. At least we have demonstrated that we can uh, reliably produce highly charged ions uh, from such samples. So uh, for this, we implemented in the uh, mini EBIT uh, laser ablation or laser desorption uh, technique. So we just place a solid uh, uh, sample next to the ionization region of, of the EBIT. And from the other direction, we uh, shine a laser beam onto, onto the sample. So atoms uh, evaporated from the surface of the sample across uh, the ionization region where they get ionized, trapped, and charged bread to high, high uh, charge states. So. This uh, uh, EBIT uh, now allows us um, uh, to do our measurement not only on stable nucleus, but in fact on radioactive, relatively lonely radioactive nucleus, uh, which can be produced elsewhere, for example, and brought to, to our experiment. So uh, ions leave uh, both EBITs with a kinetic energy of a about six kV per charge state, then ions from the Dresden EBIT pass through a 90 degree dipole magnet for M over Q separation. The tip EBIT beam line is optimized for uh, maximum uh, ion transmission efficiency. So instead of a dipole magnet, uh, we use in this beam line a Bradbury Nielsen gate. Both uh, beam lines meet a two 90 degree electrostatic cylindrical bandas, uh, which guide the ions down toward the pinion trap mass spectrometer. And prior to uh, capturing ions in, in the pinion traps, we slow, slow them down to, to an energy of a few EV with uh, two pulse leaf tubes. And then we capture them in the pinion trap. The pinion trap has several unique features that facilitate a very precise uh, uh, mass ratio measurement. So we have uh, a stack of five identical cylindrical uh, pinion traps. Uh, they, uh, uh, together with the associated electronics, uh, sit in, uh, in the cold bore of a seven Tesla superconducting magnet. So it means they're, uh, uh, they're cooled to, to temperature of, of four Kelvin. And uh, uh, the mass spectrometer is, is located in a room with stabilized temperature. So the temperature is stable on a level of 50 millikelvin a day. And the level of liquid helium and the pressure of helium gas in the bore are stabilized on a level of 35 micrometer and one microbar respectively. And the magnetic field demonstrates in, in such conditions um, a weak uh, drift with a decay rate of relative decay rate of 10 to minus 10 per hour. So it's very stable uh, magnetic field. And our traps are biased by, uh, by voltage uh, with a relative uh, stability better than 10, uh, 10 to minus 7 in 100 seconds. And finally, uh, we work with uh, highly, or I would say even with very highly charged ions. So the way uh, we uh, measure the trap frequencies as follows. So we attach 
uh, to one of, of the electrodes of the trap, a high quality resonator, so coil, and the inductance of, of the coil together with the capacitance of the trap, uh, they form a parallel LC circuit, so a resonance circuit with a certain resonance frequency. Uh, the trap, uh, the coil, and uh, the amplifier, signal amplifier, they're uh, cool to 4 Kelvin in order to provide a single uh, uh, ion detection sensitivity. And in the frequency domain spectrum, the thermal noise of the LC circuit takes a well-known so resonance shape with the resonance frequency of the LC circuit. So we use this LC circuit as a thermal bath to reduce uh, ion motional amplitudes. And also we can measure with the LC circuit the, the frequencies of the ion, ion motions. So we do it in the following way. Um, just right after its capture, the ion um, has usually very large uh, motional amplitudes, which we have to uh, reduce. So it means we have to cool these uh, ion motions if one of the ion motions uh, happens to have a uh, frequency uh, very close to the resonance frequency of the LC circuit, then this motion, particular motion gets uh, damped by the LC circuit. So the ion gets, or this particular motion gets into thermal equilibrium with the LC circuit. And uh, in the frequency spectrum, such a cooled ion motion reveals itself as a narrow, uh, deep, deep, the minimum, minimum which corresponds to the frequency of the cooled ion motion. So usually one just uh, uh, cools in this way only the axial motion because it's easy to adjust the frequency of the axial motion to the frequency of the LC circuit just by varying uh, the trap potential. Um, the, the radial motions are cooled indirectly uh, via just uh, the coupling to the axial motion, which is in turn coupled to the LC circuit. So such an indirect coupling to, to the LC circuit. And such a coupling of the radial motion to the axial motion uh, splits a single dip into two dips. And by measuring the frequencies so the, 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 of these two dips, one can also determine uh, the, the frequency of the coupled radial motion. So in principle, with such a relative simple deep technique, one can measure, one can cool and measure uh, the frequencies of all three uh, uh, trap motions. But usually uh, the cyclotron uh, frequency is measured with a substantially faster uh, technique, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide here. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, in order to determine the free cyclotron frequency, we have to, in fact, uh, measure all three trap frequencies. And uh, thanks to the hierarchy of trap frequencies, uh, it's efficient to measure only the trap cyclotron frequency with uncertainty with which we want to determine the free cyclotron frequency. Uh, requirements uh, on the uncertainty in, in the measurement of the XL uh, frequency, not to mention the magnetron frequency are somewhat but are more relaxed. For example, the magnetron uh, frequency we measure just sporadically once a day. It means uh, measurement of the free cyclotron frequency reduces uh, to just simultaneous measurement of two trap frequencies. Uh, so we measure the cyclotron frequency with the PNP technique, so pulse and phase technique, and XL frequency with just deep technique I explained in the previous slide. So uh, in order to measure the frequency of the cyclotron motion, we excite. Uh, this motion to a certain uh, radius uh, in order to set and measure its initial phase. Then uh, we let the cyclotron motion just evolve, so accumulate its phase for well-defined time T accumulation. And after that, uh, we uh, measure its final phase again. And the measured uh, phase uh, difference and uh, this time allows us, uh, allow us to uh, to calculate the frequency of the cyclotron motion using this such a simple formula. And um, the XL frequency is measured with the deep technique during the entire phase accumulation time of the cyclotron motion. So it's quite a elegant uh, measurement technique or measure, measurement pattern of, of two frequencies. So as I mentioned already, we have uh, five identical cylindrical traps. Um, currently, only trap two and trap three are used as measurement traps. 
the other three serve just to store ions uh, during the measurement. And measurement scheme looks as follows. We load into traps uh, two, three, and four, three ions of two species in, in the alternating sequence like this, and this is position one. And then uh, we perform uh, simultaneously uh, uh, frequency measurements on, on two ions in trap two and trap three for, for about 10 minutes or so. After, after that, we swap the ion, uh, ion species in trap two and trap three just by moving all three ions uh, up into the neighboring traps. And this is position two. And then we repeat the simultaneous uh, frequency measurement of these two ions again for 10 minutes or so. After that, we, we, we move the ions back into position one. And then this uh, measurement pattern uh, repeats until we stop the measurement. Uh, we usually uh, do our measurements at nights and on weekends. And shown here is such a series of nights and weekends measurements, which lasted with some interruptions uh, about, uh, about three weeks or so. And thanks to the uh, possibility to, to measure simultaneously, uh, to do a, a simultaneous measurements on two ions, we can now analyze the obtained data using different data analysis uh, techniques. Uh, here, I would like to show you just two such uh, techniques. The first uh, data analysis technique is called the polynomial method. I call it just a conventional data analysis method because it's widely used by uh, by many uh, pinion trap experiments. In this uh, method, we treat the data from trap two and trap three independently. So we just divide uh, the data into about two hour long groups. And within uh, each group, we uh, approximate the behavior of the cyclone frequency with a polynomial of low order. So we just feed to two sets of frequency values, uh, two polynomials, which differ from each other just by this prefactor, which is uh, R, which is the cyclotron frequency ratio we want to determine. And then ratio from all groups and from both traps merge together into, into one final um, frequency ratio, which we use to, to determine the mass ratio of ions. Um, this method uh, has additional uncertainty, which arises from certain arbitrariness in uh, choosing the size of the group and the polynomial order. So and we have to uh, take uh, into account this additional uncertainty. OK, this was the polynomial method. Um, so uh, the magnetic fields enhance the cyclone frequencies in trap two and in trap three uh, reveal actually, uh, as expected, in fact, a very similar temporal uh, behavior. It means that uh, we can assume that the ratio of the magnetic fields in these two traps is uh, constant over at least several hours. And uh, this fact underlies uh, the so-called uh, cancellation method, so the data analysis method. So the ratio of the cyclotron frequencies measured at the same time in trap two and trap three is uh, dependent on, not only on uh, the ratio of uh, the ion masses, but also on the ratio of the magnetic fields in trap two and trap three measured at this time. And it turns out that the square root of the product of such two ratios, one is measured for position one at time t1, and the other is measured for position two at time t2. This, this construction, this product is, uh, is equal to the ratio of, of the ion masses we want to determine, provided, of course, that the ratio of the magnetic fields is constant. Uh, in, in reality, of course, we observe a certain drift uh, of, of the ratio of the magnetic fields, which uh, result in additional uncertainty uh, in our uh, frequency ratio determination, which is specific to this particular method. But anyway, all in all, the uh, uh, possibility to use different data analysis methods uh, result in a very reliable and very robust uh, determination of the free cyclone frequency. OK, uh, we have a device which allows us to, uh, to determine mass, ratio, uh, mass ratios very precisely. Now, 
what can we use it for? Does anybody, uh, uh, anyone uh, uh, need such precise maturation measurements? And the, the answer is in fact, yes. Uh, some experiments uh, uh, do need uh, assistance from high precision pain and trap mass spectrometry. For example, uh, 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 here as a proof, I, I, I pick just three groups of, of such experiments. Uh, so experiments on the determination of the neutrino mass, experiments on the search uh, for the fifth, uh, fifth force, and also such low, low uncertainties are needed for search for uh, atomic metastable states. Um, let's start with uh, neutrino mass. Uh, several experiments uh, aim to determine uh, the neutrino mass with the sub EV uncertainty uh, by analyzing the, these three beta processes. So the beta minus decay of tritium, the beta minus decay of rhenium 187, and the electron capture in holmium 163. And it's uh, highly desirable to provide these experiments with uh, independently and directly determined Q values of these processes. So in the case of beta minus decay of tritium, uh, the Q value has recently been determined with the FSU trap very precisely. Um, so these two Q values uh, have been determined with ship trap, but with just moderate uncertainty of uh, 33 EV. So we have to improve this uncertainty or decrease this uncertainty by a factor of 30 at least. So these two Q values under intense uh, scrutiny of Penta trap. Now, and first we decided to address the Q value of the beta minus decay of rhenium 187. Um, so a bunch of experiments or so these experiments of Mineba, Manu and Mara uh, uh, have determined from the analysis of the electron spectrum of the beta minus decay of rhenium 187, the Q value with very low uncertainty of 1.6 EV. So now if we with Penta trap, can uh, determine the Q value with a similar uncertainty or even better, then would be just a very good mutual test of, of several techniques. So opinion trap mass spectrometry and cryogenic microcalorimetry. So the technique which uh, underlies uh, these experiments uh, as well as actually whole MIM experiments. Um, rhenium uh, and osmium 187 ions uh, is a perfect uh, uh, ion pair because the relative um, mass difference is just 10 to minus eight. So it's a perfect mass doublet to do measurements on. Uh, uh, so in fact, we just almost measure unity. So it means that uh, almost all systematic uncertainties in the measured uh, cyclotron frequencies uh, uh, cancel out in, in their ratio. So osmium, uh, uh, is truly stable. So rhenium 187 is virtually stable. So it lives 40 billion years for, for us, it's stable. And you can, uh, you can just purchase them in, in sufficiently large amount, not a problem. And moreover, we have managed to, 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 far, to, to find a more or less non-toxic volatile uh, organic compounds of these two elements. So it means uh, there were no problems with producing highly charged ions using our test uh, EBIT, so Dresden EBIT. So we worked with a charge state of 29 plus uh, because it's uh, high enough uh, so that uh, we can uh, reach the needed, uh, the, with, uh, the needed uncertainty of 10 to minus 11 or, or even below. Um, on the other hand, it's still moderate, uh, uh, so that our uh, uh, Dresden EBIT can produce uh, such uh, uh, charged states. And also, uh, theoreticians or three groups of, of theoreticians uh, were able actually to calculate uh, the total body energy difference of of 20, 29 missing electrons and rhenium and osmium with uncertainty of about one EV, and we need. Uh, this total binding energy difference uh, uh, because uh, we, we, we calculate the Q value as a difference of the masses of neutral rhenium and osmium 187, which can be rewritten as the mass of an osmium ion 29 plus times uh, the frequency ratio minus one plus this total binding energy difference. So we, uh, with Panda trap, we measured uh, the frequency ratio with uncertainty of five times 10 to minus 12. 
uh, the three institutions, uh, three groups of uh, three institutions have calculated the total Biden energy difference with uncertainty of uh, one EV. Uh, it allowed us to, uh, to determine the Q value with uncertainty of 1.3 EV. And our value is in agreement with two sigma uh, with the cryogenic microcalorimetric value. And from the agreement of these two values, we can draw the following, the following conclusion. Um, so if you are confident in our experiments, so in our uh, measurement of the frequency ratio and in the calculation of the total binding energy uh, difference, then it's a confirmation of the correctness of, um, of the model used for describing the electron spectrum of the beta minus d curve, rhenium-187. Or we can turn around uh, the uh, this situation and uh, and, uh, and say, okay, if you consider this cryogenic microcalorimetric value, uh, reference value for, um, for, for our experiment, then uh, the agreement uh, is a confirmation of theoretical formalisms used uh, to calculate the total binary energy uh, uh, difference. Um, but anyway, so it's a, it's a good mutual test of several techniques. Um, Penetrate mass spectrometry, uh, cryogenic microcalorimetry, uh, theoretical model used uh, for describing the electron spectrum of, of the beta minus decay of rhenium 187, and also uh, of, of the theoretical formalism used to, to calculate the total binary energy difference. Our next uh, measurement for experiments uh, on the determination of the neutrino mass will be the, the Q value of the electron capture in uh, Holmium 163, which uh, uh, we're going to do within uh, the framework of the ECHO collaboration. So ECHO experiments, so the ECHO stands for the electron capture and uh, Holmium experiment. Um, so they uh, plan to determine the neutrino mass with the sub EV uncertainty uh, from, from the analysis of the electron capture in holmium, holmium 163. So actually holmium uh, nucleus can capture one of its uh, innermost electron with an emission of one neutrino. Of course, we cannot detect uh, a neutrino, so it just flies away. Um, the atomic shell of the Dota nucleate of, of, of the process. So the dysprosium 163 is after capture uh, is excited. So it de excites by emitting X rays, OJ electrons. And with a cryogenic microcalorimeter, one measures the total uh, energy of the emitted particles and obtains such a, uh, a cryogenic microcalorimetric spectrum. And one tries to uh, feed a theoretical model to the experimental spectrum. And from, from, from this one determines the, the neutrino mass because the neutrino mass is a free parameter uh, of this model. In fact, uh, one can also determine the Q value of, of this process from, from, from the analysis of the spectrum because the Q value is also a parameter in the model. And if we, with Penta trap, determine the Q value independently with a similar uncertainty, then uh, the comparison of these two Q values will allow us to put uh, an upper limit on the systematic uncertainty in the neutrino mass uh, determination. And the, the ECHO experiment plans to determine the Q value with uncertainty of a few EV or so. So it means this is also our, our goal. So like a few EV. In fact, within the ECHO collaboration, uh, we already uh, determined the Q values. So one with ship trap and also with cryogenic microcalorimetry, but with a moderate uncertainty of 33 EV. So now we want to decrease the uncertainty by a factor of 30. Um, this prosium, uh, uh, so electron capture in Holmium 163 uh, has a, a Q value which is very similar to that of the beta minus DQ of rhenium 1887. It means uh, the uh, dysprosium holmium uh, uh, ions uh, uh, is also a perfect mass doublet. So we won't have any problems with uh, reaching uh, needed uncertainty, statistical uncertainty. Uh, dysprosium 163 is stable. So you can get it in, in a metal form in large 
sufficiently large amount, not a problem. The bottleneck of this uh, experiment, which makes actually this measurement by far more challenging than the experiment with rhenium osmium ions, is in fact holmium 163. Holmium is long lived, so it's not stable. It lives uh, four and a half thousand years, and uh, it has to be uh, uh, produced somewhere and brought to our experiment. And we have access to, to a solid sample with just 10 to 15 atoms. So we will use um, uh, our TIP EBIT, which has been for, 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 uh, for production of highly charged ions um, of holmium and dysprosium. So the TIP EBIT, in fact, has been designed and built special for, for, for such, uh, such measurements. So the, the measurement is now in preparation. In fact, it has been prepared. Everything uh, runs more or less smoothly. Now we are just waiting for, for sample from, from mines. And I hope so. so the real measurement will start soon, very soon. OK, now let me uh, uh, move further to uh, 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 other experiment, to the second type of, of experiments, to search for atomic metastable states. Recently, um, we discovered, and to, to speak frank, uh, frankly, uh, by chance, uh, atomic metastable state in rhenium-29 plus uh, ions and in osmium-30 plus ions. Uh, this was just a byproduct of, of our measurement of the Q value of, of the beta minus decay of rhenium-187. So we just loaded uh, three uh, identical uh, uh, rhenium-29 uh, plus ions into, into our traps just to test uh, the uh, measurement pattern, the performance of the traps. And uh, we expect, uh, so we did just a unity measurement, and, but the measurements yielded a very surprising results. So with a probability of about uh, as one would expect, or a uh, value which is a little bit larger than just unity. Then we repeated this measurement also with osmium ions, and this measurement yielded always unity. So from this, we concluded that we, we had discovered, in fact, in rhenium-29 plus ions, a uh, metastable state uh, with the excitation energy of 202 EV. If so, then uh, in osmium-30 plus ions, uh, we have to, uh, to see similar metastable state because rhenium-29 plus and osmium-30 plus ions have the same uh, atomic, uh, atomic configuration. And indeed, also in osmium 30 plus ions, we have discovered a similar metastable state with the excitation energy of 207 EV. Uh, let me move uh, uh, further to the last part of, of, of my, uh, of the last group of the experiments, which I would like to touch in my uh, measurements uh, in my talk today. So these are experiments. Um, on the search for the fifth force. So let me move it aside. Uh, for these experiments, uh, we plan to do mass ratio measurements on uh, even even isotopes of these five uh, five elements: ytterbium, neodymium, uh, barium, strontium, and calcium. Uh, we know that over 80% of all matter in the universe is invisible, non-luminous dark matter, and by, by investigating dark matter, we can probably get insight into new physical laws and, uh, and discover new, new fundamental forces. Um, unfortunately, we can't say anything certain about uh, the mass of, of dark matter particles, that the mass can, uh, can span over 80 orders of magnitudes. Now, if uh, there exists uh, light, uh, light dark matter we, uh, with a mass below 10, 1 MeV, then these uh, uh, dark matter particles have to be bosons. So they can couple quarks and leptons. So this is where uh, pen and traps just enter uh, this, this business. In uh, uh, the experiments, uh, one tries to, uh, to reveal the existence of the fifth force by just analyzing the linearity of what is just a relation between even, even elements, uh, even, even isotopes of the same element. And 
uh, this relation to the first order is, is linear and depends on the mass ratio. Um, so, and if it deviates from, uh, from, from linearity, then it would be a hint at the existence of uh, higher order standard model effects and uh, or the existence of light dark matter bosons. So it means um, and the more points the King's plot has, uh, the easier one can disentangle the contribution from high order standard model effects from the light dark matter uh, particles. So in these experiments uh, um, on the search for the fifth force, one uh, uh, do measurements on even uh, on, on uh, elements with many even even isotopes and narrow optical so quadruple transitions and uh, experiments on three uh, isotope chains so ytterbium calcium and strontium are um, advancing now or showing steady advance, uh, steady progress uh, there are two more uh, isotope chains which lag behind currently, but they will, I hope, uh, uh, gain attention at some point and, and will catch up with these experiments. Um, uh, so find these experiments where I managed to, to, to measure uh, these isotope shifts with uncertainties down to a few 10 uh, uh, hertz. At this level of uncertainty, the masses are known uh, precisely enough, so they're not major constraint to these experiments. But, but in the uh, near future, one plans to uh, reduce the uncertainties in the isotope shift uh, measurements by many orders of magnitude uh, to about 10 millihertz. It means that we'll have to measure mass ratios of these isotopes with uncertainty of 10 to minus 11. Uh, in order not to, to become a major constraint. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so we have to demonstrate that uh, we can measure with pentatrap the mass ratios with this uncertainty also of non-mass doublets, not only mass doublets. Uh, because you can see that the, the, real, uh, the mass, absolute mass difference between the isotopes of the same element uh, amounts to two mass units. So it's quite a challenge. And in order to demonstrate uh, our capability, we, uh, we recently have, um, have measured the mass ratios of, uh, uh, of xenon uh, isotopes. And I guess one, two, three, four, five, six, six xenon isotopes with uncertainty uh, of about 10 to minus uh, 11. So we can do it. And it means that uh, mass ratios of, of, uh, of the isotopes of these five elements on, are on our to-do list. And we will just uh, uh, address um, uh, these elements just right after our whole name dysprosium measurement. Fine. Um, I guess I've been talking already too long and too much, and now it's time just to, to summarize my talk. Probably I will just skip uh, skip uh, the introductory part and come directly to the pentatrap. So pentatrap is a representative of offline penetraps, and um, currently our uh, uh, measurement program focuses on, uh, on, on, on measurements for experiments on the determination of the neutrino mass and on, on the search for the fifth force. And uh, we also have initiated a search for atomic metastable uh, states. This is what we are planning to do in the next, uh, I guess, several years. Okay. Thank you very much for, for your attention. And this is the Pentatrap team. Thank you.